Community and Usher Ministry in SIB KL. Okay, he is also in the senior pastoral leadership team and preaches in the main services. He has been invited to speak in several young adult college and youth events. Ah, that is his specialty. Right? He is passionate in developing leaders. Right? Passionate about leadership, teaching, theology, and leading worship. Ah, he's a worship leader as well. I saw him worshiping this morning. Wow, so enthusiastically, full of energy. Right? He also leads in a few young adult groups together with his wife, Kim Lian. And recently, ah, recently he became a father to two sons, Hidaidia and uh, Macarius. Ah, congratulations. Please give him a big hand for being a father of twins. Wow. Hey, twin. Huh? No, no twin. <laughs> okay, for being a father of two. Huh? Okay, so please help me welcome... Uh, Pastor Isaac. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. A very good morning to all. It's so good to be back. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, yeah, not twins. It's okay. Uh, but they're very close. So they, they are, they're really good brothers. Um, they're age three and age five. So they love to play with each other. And um, for that, I say hallelujah. Uh, um, you know, I, I really want to honor um, NLCC. Thank you so much for having me back. It's, it's really a pleasure. Thank you so much, Elder uh, and Deacons, for uh, inviting me back, uh, uh, and especially on your 27th anniversary. Um, you know, I was looking around, I was going, wow, um, I'm not too sure how old they are here. Okay, I, do, I don't know how old you are, but... Uh, I, I used to be young as well, and then I went, okay, 20, 27th anniversary feels very old to the young, right? They're like, oh my goodness, my, uh, my church is a little old. But then I want to say to the young ones, I said, For all of us else, we all wish we are 27. So uh, I wish I was 27 all the time. Uh, it's, uh, but whatever age we are, um, I'm sure God has brought you into your season and to your glory. But uh, um, happy birthday, 27th birthday. You know, before I begin... Uh, kudos to the worship team. Uh, it was really, really good. Worship is the bottom of my heart. Um, I must say, I really love your chord progression when you transposed uh, in a thousand hallelujah, and then you went a little gospel. I love it. Well done, well done. I picked it up. Don't worry. Somebody's hearing you. Somebody heard you. Um, and you sang Lion. Well done. That's not an easy song to sing. Um, but just in case, just in case we all think, wow, Lion is, uh, does it have any meaning to the song? Actually, it does. Do you know the song Lion was pulled from Isaiah chapter 40? Let me just read it a little bit so you know uh, what it means when we sing, prepare, prepare the way of the Lord. You know, all valley be raised up, all mountain be raised, may made low. It's actually from Isaiah chapter 40, and I'll read it from verse 3 to 5. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. That's what, that's what the bridge means. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill be made low, every rough ground shall become level, the rugged places are plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen? That's Isaiah 40, the breakthrough verse in the whole book of Isaiah. And I just want to speak this uh, before I even preach, that the glory of the Lord will be revealed in NLCC. Don't we all want the glory of God to just be revealed here, just to the presence of God to just rest in this place? Amen? You know, um, speaking about the presence of God, um, I really love how the table tennis tournament played out. There was four winners, right? Sorry, I, the rest, I'm not too sure. Uh, 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 I, you know names, but I only caught Alpha. I caught Alpha being the first, all right? So Alpha means you're the first. You're the first to what? You're the first uh, to bring Rehoboth in. Rehoboth both means a land where you will flourish, all right? So you will flourish, all right? So let it be the land that you flourish. But flourish in what? Flourish so that you have a rhema word from God. Uh, you get a rhema word from God. But what is the rhema word from God? That all of us will return to Eden one day, all right? The new Jerusalem. We will all return to Eden. So that I think the, the winners of your ping pong tournament is very prophetic. Very, very prophetic. <laughs> So good. And I, I, I heard uh, uh, that Eden is the smaller cell group. Yeah. So don't despise the small and the, uh, uh, because they will always be the first. 
they will always be the best, all right? Amen. Okay, that is not what I came here to say. Um, it's really not. Let me, let me find my, my scripture. But uh, I want to bring warm regards from SIBKL. Um, uh, I think SIBKL, uh, it's always good to be kingdom-minded and always good to have uh, collaborations over kingdom. Because at the end of the day, um, in, the, in the whole economy of God, there really is only one church. <laughs> You know, there's no, there, I know on earth, and of course for practical reasons, we need to have many churches. That's okay to reach out to different areas in, in the world, which is fine. But of course in heaven, he does not see, you know, Subang or PJ or, or Australia or Singapore. He doesn't see all this. He sees everything belongs to him. And it's all one kingdom and one church. And this church is the bride of Christ. And we're all the bride of Christ. And we're, we're, even though we worship in different areas now, because of logical reasons, not everybody can go worship in Singapore, right? So we have to have different churches there. Uh, uh, but one day we will all worship together in the New Jerusalem, right? In, in heaven, right? And we will all rejoice together and sing songs together. Um, I, brought a, I brought a word of God today, and I hope it will encourage you, because it's the 27th anniversary. Um, I really hope it will encourage you. And I draw this from Hebrews chapter 12. And the title of my sermon is Run Your Race. You have a grace for your race. Hebrews chapter 12. Let me find my Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And let me read it for you once through, and then I'll go through the points. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's just a very short scripture but I find this very encouraging for me and very powerful. I also want to send regard, before I forget, my, from my wife, uh, Pastor Kim. She really would have loved to be here, but we couldn't find a babysitter for our three and five-year-old uh, so early in the morning uh, because everybody had things to do on a Sunday morning. So she couldn't be here, but she would have loved to be here uh, because she came with me the, the last time. Um, so greetings uh, from my wife um, and my family. Therefore, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. You know, when I hear this, just one short verse. Therefore, we are surrounded by great cloud of witnesses. Do you know what it really reminds me of? You know, this scripture came to me a bit at the end of last year. And what happened at the end of last year is a reminder for me of where we once were. Now, MCO seems like a, a eon ago, like a decade ago. Um, it seems like uh, 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 it has passed, never to return, hallelujah, right? Uh, never to go in isolation and uh, quarantine, hallelujah, ever again, uh, no more pandemic, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But um, it, this reminds me that a lot of us, if not most of us here during the MCO, we would have felt a little lonely. We would have felt like we're fighting the great fight of faith all by ourselves, um, we would have felt like there is, there is no church to go to, physical church. We go to online church, but online church is only as good as sitting at home watching, watching it online, and you're still just by yourself. At most, if you, if you have, you have families. Uh, if you don't have a family, you're just all by yourself, quarantined, all at home. And it really reminds me that sometimes, even though we may not feel that way anymore physically because we can gather and we can meet people and we can come back to church and cell groups, praise God, but sometimes inside our hearts, we still feel lonely. And sometimes inside our hearts, we feel like we are the only one fighting the great f fight of faith. That we have the Elijah syndrome, right? Uh, I'm the only one carrying the baton of faith. There's nobody else. And that's how we can feel sometimes inside our heart. We're all alone in this world. Nobody would understand my pain. Nobody would understand what I'm going through. Nobody understand if you're sick. Nobody understand how you know, the, my sickness that I'm going through. Nobody will understand whatever it may be. You know, sometimes I feel about that myself, which is why I feel so strongly. I know I am not, I am middle-aged, let's put it that way. I'm not 27, right? But I really wish I was. I'm 39, I'm 39, middle-aged. But truth be told is I, I live in pain because I have a, a spinal thing and I live in pain every day of my life for the last six or seven years. So I'm always constantly in pain. And I always, I, every time uh, I'm in pain, I always uh, uh, ask and look around 
And I always ask myself, does anybody even understand what I'm going through? And, and the, 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 the group of people, now forgive me for saying this, but my father's in the same group, so it's okay. The, the group of people that I resonate a lot with are usually the, the retirees and the seniors, like my father. Because more often than not, you'll be the, there'll be the group of people that would understand pain, you know, physical pain, a little bit more than the younger ones. So when I, even though, yes, I, I reach out to the youth, the campus and the young adults, I, I reach, I'm a next-gen pastor, um, they, they don't understand my pain. They don't understand what I'm going through. At most, they'll pray for me. At most, they sympathize with me. But I, sometimes I feel alone in my group of friends. Because nobody, like how many of you would understand that you go through pain every day of your life? Like, no amount of pain medication will take away the pain or whatever it may be. And this verse really resonates with me because I have a great cloud of witnesses in heaven that is cheering me on. That in, on earth, on earth, not everybody would understand what you're going through. Like some of us were going through a divorce. Some of us were going through a, a, a parent and child a, a, a bad relationship. Some of us are going through a sickness. Some of us are going through scams. I'm just ministering to a few people that I, I think is a scam and, and they're bleeding money and it's, they're, it's very painful. Um, and nobody else will understand unless you have gone through a scam yourself. Some of you have school exams uh, uh, um, and that adults or people like me will probably never understand anymore what you're going through exams. So praise the Lord because I hear exams have changed very much. I hear laughter there. You're going through exams? We'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. And sometimes we feel alone. Like who would understand my grief and my pain? But here in the book of Hebrews, it says, there is a great cloud of witnesses. You are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Never forget that the people who come before you, the people that are forefathers that come before you, let's not even talk about one generation before. The forefathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob came before you. Your fathers, your grandfathers, the great cloud of witnesses. This church is 27 years old. But I want to remind you that the church of God is not 27 years old. It is 2,000 years old. We just sang the last song, uh, 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 praise, praise, uh, oh, what is that song, the title of that song? But it says, and the church of Christ was born. What's the title of that song? King of Kings, thank you very much. And the church of Christ was born and the Holy Spirit lit the flame. That was 2,000 years ago. And in 2,000 years, there have been so many Christians that came before. So many Christians that have gone through worse things. I was just talking to a group of people that shall not be named that have gone through persecution in their home country. That they're here as refugees and they're going through persecution in their home country because of their faith. And I, sometimes I, I pray for them, but I may never understand what they go through because Praise God, I'm not persecuted for my faith in this country. So thank you, Jesus. I hope I will never be persecuted for my faith. But when I hear their story, I go, wow, you have been through so much. You have gone through starvation. You have gone through beatings because of your faith. And you're still here praising God. And I may not understand what you go through, but I want you to know that we are cheering you on. That there are martyrs in heaven. The first martyr in the Bible, Stephen will understand what you are going through because he has been martyred for his faith. So even though in this church in Malaysia, maybe people don't know what you're going through, but I want you to be encouraged that there is at least one that I know, Stephen, who is martyred for his faith. He would understand what you are going through. So I want us just to remind us, I want to remind all of us here that you have a great cloud of witnesses. It is not just one cloud. It is not just one droplet of rain or water in heaven. There is a cloud of witnesses surrounding you. But what are they surrounding you for? And what should we do? And then it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. You see, one thing that the cloud of witnesses have gone through is that they have been victorious through their sin and everything that hinders them. They have been victorious and that's why there can be clouds of witnesses in heaven. And sometimes we allow things that hinder us, sin that hinders us from living our best life, from living a best life for Jesus Christ, from going all out for Jesus because sometimes we understand the guilt and the shame of what hinders us, sin that hinders us. And in the MCO, it's so easy for us to remember that there are so many things that hinders us from loving and worshipping Christ. You know, um, when you watch church online, how many of us easily saw a pop-up notification from Facebook, Instagram, or 
WhatsApp, and then you're so easily distracted. All right? In the next 15 minutes, you're wondering, should I or should I not open that WhatsApp chat group? All right? Because, because nobody's watching, only me, right? That's one thing that hinders us. Now that we have no more quarantine, how many of us goes, all right, you know, I can go back to my job or go back to my life or go back to my enjoyments that I don't have to come to church anymore because I can go to church online. These are little things, little things in life that so easily hinders us from being a community of faith. There are sins in our life that so easily entangles us. And before long, if we don't cut the sin off at its root, it would entangle us and we no longer have faith. We no longer believe. We no longer come to church. And we know, friends, a lot of us here, we will know people that no longer believe, that no longer come to church because they just fell away. They shipwrecked their faith, 1 Timothy chapter 1. They shipwrecked their faith because of the lurings of the world and of the things that, that, that gives pleasure or sometimes the things that give pain. And we're just reminded here today, throw it off. You know, when Paul wrote this and he was running the great race, you know, back in those times, they don't run with um, awesome tracksuits or whatever it may be. They just run with a loincloth at best. Let's not get our imaginations wild here, but they run with a loincloth at best. And some believe that they used to run naked because they want to throw off everything that entangles. They want to make sure that the scarf that they're wearing or the shirt that they're wearing will not trip them. The shoe that they're wearing will not trip them and they will just run that race. And it's the same analogy Paul is using in this life. All these little things that, that entangles us can easily just derail us from our race. And then Paul says, run with perseverance, the race that is marked out for you. Now, this is one thing that is really on my heart. How many of us here you know the race that is marked out for you. You see, all of us here, we have a specific race. We are all called to run a very general race. We are called to run the general race of faith to be reunited with Jesus at the end of this life. That is the general race that we're all called to run. But some of us here, if not all of us here, we are called to a very specific race as well. What is your specific race? For example, I knew all those years ago that I have a race to run and I knew that I'm called for full time. I'm called to be a pastor. And because I know my race, even though jobs that came in that offered me very lucrative salaries, that really attractive salaries, I went, that it doesn't attract me anymore because I know the race that I am called to run. And offers that come in with not just attractive salaries, but um, very good company perks. But I said no, because I know the race that I'm called to run. I said no to so many things because I know to whom the race that I am marked out for. This is the race marked out for me, but it may not be the race marked out for all of you. And you have got to ask, what is the race that is marked out for you? Because if you do not know your race, if you do not know your call and your purpose, then you are aimless when you run. You would be running after things, not knowing where your calling is, not knowing where you are called for. I really like uh, 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 when Elder said in uh, the, 25th, the 27th anniversary of this church that we have one great purpose. You see, at least this church know the purpose that you are called for. Church, do you know the purpose of why you are called to be in NLCC? You need to know because if you don't know why the purpose that you have been called to this church, then your eyes will always be wandering to another place, to another place, to another place because you're looking for that call. Young ones, next gen, and this is always the cry of my heart, do you know the purpose to which you are called? Because if you do not know, then everything will be attractive to you. You wouldn't know, should I take this job or that job or that job? Because everything is attractive because you do not know to where you are called. This company is attractive to you. Another country will be attractive to you because you do not know to where you are called. You know, there was a point in my life when I was 24, I had to make a decision between um, getting a PR in England or coming back to Malaysia. I had to make that choice. And as I prayed for three years, God gave me a very clear answer. He said, Malaysia is the place for you forego everything else. Forego your PR in any other country. Give it up. And of course, that's not easy. Being a young person, you know, wanting to live whatever life I wanted to live back then, so many years ago. But because I knew 
And God said, this is where you belong. I knew. And therefore, it's easy for me to say no to England, no to Singapore, no to Australia, because I know the race that is marked out for me. There is only one time where you can stop running your race. The second after your last breath on earth, that is when you stop running your race. As long as there is breath in your body, you run this race. You run the great race of faith that is marked out for you because you do not know the impact that God has on you when you know your race. You see, the race could be you are called to be a housewife, just like my mother. And there is nothing wrong with that race, I want you to know. What is wrong with being a housewife? Because my mother who sold 25 years of prayer into me called me out of darkness into His glorious light and now I'm a pastor. If she did not run her race, I would not be here today. Amen? So if you are a housewife here, don't think that you are not good enough or don't think that you are called unlike the business people. That's not true. That is a race that is also marked out specifically for you because you do not know as a housewife how many sons and daughters you would impact. Spiritual sons as well, spiritual daughters as well. Maybe other housewives that will be impacted by you. If you're in the business sector or if you're in a young fresh grad sector or study sector, you need to know the race that is marked out for you. God, what are you calling me for? Because before long, when you join the banking sector, sorry, I pick up banking because I have a lot of banking friends, okay? But I'm not against bankers. I don't know who, how, whether your bankers are not here in this place. But a lot of banking friends tell me that in order to progress in a career, they need to go out and mingle and drink and socialize with people and everything that comes with socializing, whatever it means. Now, if you're in the banking sector and you dis disagree with me, forgive me. Okay, I just get my sources from bankers. That's all I get my sources from, all right? All right, and it's not just the banking. I heard other industries as well. But if you do not know your race that is marked out for you, that is the race that I'm called to be holy, I'm called to be set apart, then it'd be so easy for you to say, all right, that's okay. Let me just go, let's just go mingle with those people. And you will be so easily entangled in a sin that grips you. And then you'll find that you have no more appetite to come back to church. If you're a retiree in this place, you know, in, in, back in SIBKL, we have a whole bunch uh, of retirees. We call, they call themselves, not we call them, they call themselves the Golden Eagles, all right? Because they are of an eagle generation, and to them, they're no longer silver or bronze. They're gold, all right? So to them, they're gold because my, this generation, my generation, we are the bronze generation, all right? Then 20 years older than me is the silver generation. Then for them in the 60s or 70s, they're the golden generation. I say, hallelujah. One day I hope to be like you in a golden generation running in the race of faith as well. But when I tell you, um, in their age group, they know their purpose. What they love to do is, they love, I, I'm quite jealous of them to be honest with you. They have road trips to Ipoh just to Makano and then they come back. They road trips to Malacca just to Makan and I go, wow, you live a better life than I do. You know, that's a really fun life. I really love your life, you know. But what they do is not just Makan because they know their race called out. They will invite other retirees, other seniors, other Golden Eagles to come and they will bring, along, bring them along in their road trip. And now Golden Eagles is bigger than our next gen uh, population in our church because they're so actively uh, bringing all the retirees together and evangelizing and bringing them to Christ. And that is so exciting because they know the race that is marked out for them. They know that race that is marked out for them. And I go, wow. And I tell you something, they always ask, Pastor, the race that is marked out for me is not to hold a camera in live streaming anymore after, after the pandemic because they will always say, we, have, we know nothing about live streaming and sound and all these fancy equipments anymore. Back in their time, they said, all we did was have a, uh, no longer a digital piano, they have an actual piano in the, in the church and they play and they sing hymns and that's all they do. So they say they don't, they, don't, they don't understand all these things anymore, but that's not the race that is marked out for them. And they always say the race that is marked out for us is to have a good evangelistic life in our retirement years. And I go, wow, we cheer you on. One day I will be like you, who knows? And I would cheer you on. I would cheer you on because by cheering you on, I'm cheering myself on as well in 40 to 50 years time. I don't know. But I also want to say, you have a great cloud of witnesses that is cheering you on for your race. What is your race? When you know the race that is marked out for you, you will know how to run. You will know how to, to take off the clothes that entangles you and run that race. 
Next life. And then it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. See, all of us, when we run our own individual race, how do we know what is our end point? What are we running towards? We're running towards a lot of things, yes. Even for me as a pastor, what am I running towards? It says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of your faith. Never let your eyes and your gaze off of Jesus, even for a second. Now, I want to say this here. It's a lot easier for the Golden Eagles generation to fix their eyes on Jesus, I believe. But it is a lot harder for our next gen to fix our eye, their eyes on Jesus. Because in the next gen, there's a lot of things that distracts. Just think of your sons. Think of your daughters. Or grandsons and granddaughters, if you have any. It's harder for them to fix their eyes on Jesus because they're so distracted by the things of this world. Where AI is just around the corner. Where new technology is just around the corner. Where there is so much money to be made. It used to be NFTs and then it crashed. It used to be crypto, then it crashed. Right? You know what I'm talking about. It used to be this big bank and all the bank crashed this year. Right? It used to be this mineral and then with the Russian-Ukraine uh, uh, war, the, the mineral prices dropped or increased depending on which mineral you, you're, you're going to buy. You see the young generation, we want to we wanna make it. We want to make it big. We want to be somebody. We want to have the nice big house like everybody have. We want a nice big car and honestly speaking, there's nothing wrong with having a nice big house. Nothing wrong with having a good, good family and providing for your kids. Nothing wrong with that. But because we want that, we fix our eyes on what can get us there. The monies of this world, the promotion of this world. We fix our eyes on what gets us there because that's what we want. But I'm telling you that only the 39 years of my life, there is nothing more fulfilling than fixing my eyes on Jesus Christ. Because the things of this world would come and go in a blink of an eye. I have a friend who invested 20,000 ringgit on cryptocurrency. At the height of cryptocurrency, he made a lot of money when, when Bitcoin went from this much to that much and from 20,000 ringgit went up to six digits. But then it came crashing down all in seven days and he lost it all. And he came back saying, 20,000 was my life saving. He was a young guy. It's life saving. He said, Pastor, what's the point? And I, I looked at him and says, in this world, nothing is sure. Nothing is sure. Your job is not sure. Your health is also not sure. Your, your investments and trading is not sure. Who knows, a war will break out and the, the property that all you own is just gone. I was just uh, speaking to somebody, a pastor from Ukraine, came back. Bought a house in Ukraine before the war. And just in one week, Russia came in and her house was gone. And all the banking loan and all the mortgage and all the investment and renovation just gone in one week. And of course, it's, there's, it's so devastating. But it only serves to remind me that everything in this world is fleeting. The clothes, the food that you eat, well, the, the food that you eat is not fleeting because it, it goes here, okay? So we are reminded every day. It goes, it goes here. In case you can't see me, I'm, I'm pointing here. And then we are reminded every day. But everything else in this world is fleeting, except Jesus Christ. He is your only sure foundation. You want, you want peace? Jesus. You want joy? Jesus. You want purpose in your life? Jesus. You want love and hope? Jesus. That is the only sure thing that you can bank on in this life. And that is why when you run your race, you fix your eyes on Jesus because He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is the pioneer and the perfecter of your faith. And that is the only one sure thing that I know in my life that I also know that you know, that you fix your eyes on Him and things will go well for you. Why? Why do we have to fix our eyes on Jesus? Because I want you to know that Jesus also fixed His eyes on us. How do I know that? For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne room of God. You know what this verse means? That when Jesus was walking to that cross and He had to endure the sin of the world, He had to endure being separated from His heavenly Father, 
the sin of the world was on his shoulders. The beatings and the scorning of the world was on his shoulders. What kept him going? Obedience is correct. Submission to the Father is correct. Love of this world and love for the Father is correct. But this verse also tells us that he had his eyes on you and he had his eyes on me. For the joy set before him. What is that joy that is set before him? It is the joy knowing that because of what he did on that cross, you and I are now set free. You and I can now be reunited with the Father in heaven. That is the joy. You and I have sozo life, the full life, the full peace and joy and love of God that lives in us. That is the joy that is set before Him. The fact that we are sitting here and worshipping Him, that is the joy that is set before Him. And He kept His eye knowing that you and I will receive Him and you and I will be in heaven. And because He had His eyes on you, because He knew that you will be saved, because He knew that you needed Him, that is the joy that He had. And that is why He endured the cross. He endured the scorns. He endured the beating because He knew that I will receive Him one day. He knew that you will receive Him one day. And that's why we can now fix our eyes on Jesus. We do not live, lift our eyes for a moment and a second of a day. Not even a second. We don't turn to the left. We don't turn to the right. But we obey and we follow the Word of God all the days of our lives. Amen? Consider Him, church, who endured such opposition from sinners. Do you know that this verse pricks my heart all the time? Because even though He knew that we will receive Him. In our fallen nature, we still oppose Him. In our fallen nature, we still struggle against temptation. In our fallen nature, we still scorn Him sometimes. We still turn our back against Him sometimes. We forget Him sometimes, don't you? And even though He endured such opposition from the people that He loved, He still went and died on that cross. He still saved. You are His joy. You are the joy of His heart. Seeing how you love Him, seeing how you've got joy and peace in your life, that brings joy to Him, so much so that He endured the cross. And that is why He said, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You see, in this life, it can be discouraging when somebody criticizes the church. When the world out there want to throw stones at the church and blame the church and play religious cards when it comes to politics. And it hurts, doesn't it? It's discouraging. But I tell you what, sometimes it can also come from within. Sometimes Christians can be, say hurtful things. Sometimes Christians might not be the most thankful most gracious, most merciful. Sometimes we Christians can also be very mean. But God said, but Jesus said, if He endured the opposition of sinners and He did not grow weary, then He's encouraging us today. Endure. Endure the journey. Endure the race that is marked out for you. Do not grow weary. Do not lose heart. So when you're running your race, are people scorning you and mocking you? Do not grow weary. Do not lose heart. When you're running a race, one day, maybe you stripped, you sprained your ankle. Maybe some of you are sick or just like me, you're in pain. Do not grow weary. Do not give up on your faith. Do not lose heart. If you're running this race and maybe you, go, you went bankrupt because you had financial difficulties, do not lose weary. Do not lose heart. Do not be weary. If you're running a race and sometimes you feel discouraged by other Christians, do not grow weary. Do not lose heart. Because the verse here never said, your faith is built on the faith of other Christians. Your faith is built on the, on the faith of, of your, your pastors or your leaders. No. It says, fix your eyes only on one person, Jesus Christ, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Amen. I want to show you this video. I want to play this video for you because this video really touched me. This video might touch you. And in this video, you would see, um, one second, not yet, just give me one second. You would see in this video 
how somebody who's running a race, this somebody who's running a race is not young, this somebody who's running this race is elderly, and I'll explain how elderly later on, but this person running this race finished because there was people cheering her on and nothing stood in her way. Can we play the video from the beginning? Thank you. Better, not older, that was Harriet Anderson. The crowd was so revved up because a 79-year-old woman had never done that before. And here she comes down a Lee Drive. I didn't have to say a thing. It's the loudest I have ever heard a crowd in Kona. And finally, I get the honor of bringing in Harriet Anderson from California as an Iron Man. And that's all I needed to say. I didn't say anything for about a minute or two after that because the Iron Spectators took care of everything. Because no one ever thought that could happen, but she proved them wrong. And she was, in my mind, the most beautiful Iron Man finisher ever. Harriet Anderson. If you don't know Iron Man, don't worry, let me hear to explain. And no, I'm not asking you to sign up for the next one. <laughs> and Iron Man is where you have to, I can't remember how many miles now, um, you have to do three things. You have to swim X amount of miles, you have to run X amount of miles, and then you have to cycle an X amount of miles, and you have to do all this under seven hours. Am I right? If you're an Iron Man here, you would know. Under seven hours, and you have to do all these things. Harriet Anderson was 79 years old. 79 years old, and she finished Ironman. Like for me, it's okay if I can finish five kilometers. I will pat, my, pat myself on the back, I'll buy myself a very nice big meal, and I say, congratulations, Isaac, you, you did it, it's five kilometers. But wow, 79 years old, and she finished Ironman. You see, there's a few things that you can see in the video, and there's a few things that you cannot see. One thing that you see is you see her at 79, you see her finishing the last mile um, on foot. You also got to see a great cloud of spectators cheering her on. That's what you saw. But now let me tell you what you didn't see. That from behind the scenes, this story becomes more beautiful. What you didn't see is that Harriet Anderson, at the last mile, at the last mile, that last five minutes, she only had five more minutes to finish this race. If she didn't complete it in five minutes, she's, she's not going to qualify. Even though she passed the finish line, she doesn't qualify as an Ironman. You must finish it in under five minutes. What you didn't see is that she was about to give up. Her body was about to give up. She was 79. You can't blame her. She was about to give up. But then the spectators cheered her on. There was a roar of spectators that cheered her on for a good five minutes. And because, and in the post-interview, she said because she could hear the roar of people cheering her on, she kept going. She pushed. She pushed and she finished the last. And she, you saw her wobble and somebody had to hold her. That's because her body was about to give up. And that is what we don't see in that video. And that's what we all need in this life people and that's why you're in cell groups that's why you come to church don't discourage one another we come to church your life would have been terrible the last one week but cheer each other on spur each other on i tell you who needs spurring on the next generation needs spurring on it needs the older generation to say next gen you've got this i don't know how many next gen here but i know you're sitting there next gen you've got this I know you came from worship practice. I know you had to worship here. I know you had to learn the songs, but you got this. You are doing well. Run the race. Finish this race. Come on, this is your race. Don't give up. Keep running. Keep running. You may have 60 years to go. I don't know how old you are. You, maybe you have got 80 years to go, depending on how old you are. You have 80 years to go, but keep running. You see everybody else in this room? They're cheering you on. They're cheering you on. Don't give up. Don't look anywhere else. This is where you are called to be. This is the race marked out for you. I'll tell you one more thing that, that this video didn't show. And with this, I want to close. The, what the video didn't show is that Harriet Anderson tried to finish Iron Man 40 times. 40 times in her lifetime. 40 times. So she, she tried when she was in her 20s. And she failed. 
until she was 79. But I tell you why she failed. There was once she collapsed while swimming. There's once she, she tripped. A few times she tripped and she sprained her ankle, couldn't continue. There was an, another time she was, uh, she was diagnosed with something, so she had to take a break for 10 years, and, and then she came back strong. There's a few times, whatever it may be, that she couldn't continue because of family things. She said it all in the post-interview. And, and then everybody asked her, but then why do you still keep going at 79? Because she said, I have a race to finish. I won't pass until it's finished. You see, she, she knows the race that is marked out for her. I don't know if she's a Christian, and I hope she is, but we've got a better race. Some of us here for 40 years, you've, you've, you've got trips and falls. You've, sometimes you fail the race. Some of you here, you may have children that are no longer coming to church and you feel like a failure as a parent. Don't, because your race is not over. Keep praying. I was praying for a mother um, just yesterday. Her son's no longer coming to church. Her brother is no longer coming to church. And she said, what do I do? She's about 65. I says, well, you haven't, breath, you haven't breathed your last breath. It means your race praying for your brother and your son is not over. Keep praying. Keep believing. Maybe this is the race marked out for you. Maybe you are not called to be like Billy Graham, preach and evangelize in a stadium of a million people. That's one in a billion. And your race could be as simple as pray for your family and your son. Don't look down on your race. That is your race marked out for you, called by God specifically for you. Some of us here were sick. We're sick. And we feel like giving up. Or we know people who gave, gave up. Don't. Keep running this race. Because it says, and let us run with perseverance. Perseverance means hard work. Perseverance means consistency. Perseverance means commitment. They were committed to the cause. Let nothing derail me because I follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. So no matter what discouragement may come your way, no matter what disappointments may come your way, run this race with perseverance because there is a cloud of witnesses that is cheering you on. Amen? You know, on the 27th, 27th anniversary of NLCC, I want to I do something bold. I want to do something different. Some of us here may never have anybody cheering us on. And I understand. We're all Asians, okay? It's difficult for Asians to say, you got this. You know, I'm cheering you on. I support you. You know, it's different for us Asians. Maybe for Ang Mo, it's a bit easier, lah, you know? They're a bit more, that's their culture. For us, our culture is, hey, I, I support you in your monthly repayment of your car. That's me supporting you already, huh? Don't need me to say I support you, huh? That's my support, right? Every month the money goes in, it's my support for you, okay? Uh huh. All right? But young generations, sometimes we need the verbal thing, you know? We forget that it's not our culture to, you know, we go to your house and we visit you, we bring some kueh. That's me supporting you, huh? Don't need me to also say, huh, I support you, I cheer you, you know? But sometimes we, we need it. But don't you think sometimes we need it? Sometimes we need to hear words of encouragement. For those who are very word-based, you need to hear it, the words of encouragement. You need to hear the cheer because nobody has cheered for you for the last 60, or 50, 40 years of your life. Nobody cheered for you. You never ran this race. So what I want to do today is, I want us all to stand if that's okay. And I want us all to just close our eyes just for one minute. We're going to close our eyes for one minute and then we're going to open our eyes. In that closing of your eyes, I want you to imagine people that have gone to heaven before you that you know. I know so many that have gone to heaven before my time, old and young alike, that now they are now witnesses in heaven cheering you on. You're not alone in this fight. You're not in alone in this race. And then what, at the count of three, so don't, not yet, at the count of three, I want us to be bold today. Do something different. I want us all to clap at the count of three. And I want us to give us the biggest cheer to encourage one another. And when you close your eyes and you're cheering, I want you to imagine that the whole church is cheering for you. Everybody is cheering for you to finish this race well. Run it well. Don't give up. And then after one minute, I'll say, open up your eyes. And then I want you to go around. 
High five one another. Shake somebody's hand. Cheer. Keep cheering. Shake somebody's hand. Encourage them. Let this be a five minutes of the weird moment where we Asians encourage one another. All right? Just say, you got this. Say something in your language or whatever you're comfortable with. I cheer you on. I support you. I encourage you. Say something encouraging to one another. What do you think as well? You do it one, one another if you're not holding an instrument. All right? So can we do that? Can we be, give our loudest cheer for one another? It's 27 years. You have run a good race of 27, but now you will run another 27. Let's cheer. Come on. You can do better than that. Cheer one another on. You can do better than that. Come on. Put your hands together. That's right. Run this race. You got this. Run this race. Run this race. Now open up your eyes and shake somebody's hand. Shake somebody's hand and cheer them on. Give them a high five. Give them a hug. Give them a hug and say, you got this. Run this race. Come on. You did well. You have done well. Hallelujah, you did well. Thank you, Jesus. Encourage one another. It's not easy being a Christian. It's not easy serving God. But you did it. You did it. You're here. You're here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I want to close in a word of prayer that I pray will encourage you. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, this life may not be easy. And all of us here, we would have discouragements and disappointments in this life. But Father God, I pray that because of your Holy Spirit, because you endured that cross, because of us, the joy that was set before you, Father God, I pray that we will finish this race, that we will run this race well that we will run this race with joy. We wouldn't run this race, race with our head between our legs with, this, with just sadness, but we will run this race with joy, knowing that you are the perfecter of our faith, knowing that whatever we are called to run, Father God, you will perfect it and you will bring it to fruition. I pray, Father God, that we cast aside all distractions, all discouragements, all disappointments. We put it aside so that we can just fix our eyes on you and we will finish this race well. And I thank you, Jesus, because I know that you and all the angels and all the witnesses in heaven, you are cheering us on. You are cheering us on in heaven. So I thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.